what he does so well, which is give us this overview-ish of, um, of Holocaust and genocide studies. Um, so to get our feet wet a little bit, give us some background. And then um, if you are fascinated by it and want to know more, we'll give you all kinds of information about upcoming um, trainings and things like that. Um, oh, and we're being live streamed. So I'm gonna watch my potty mouth today. Um, so I'm Dr. Jerry Craver, and I'm professor of English and director of English education at UNC. And I'm a member of the HMOC, the Holocaust Memorial Organizing Committee. And I have been for a number of years. And I, um, I'm a fellow at USHMM and at Yad Vashem and at the Auschwitz Jewish Center. And, um, and I am uh, all kinds, I, I'm involved in multiple ways, but I'm not an expert. That's why Todd Hennessy is here. And Todd Hennessy is the, um, the grand poobah of the Colorado Holocaust educators. And he is the grand poobah of Yahad Colorado. And that's the Colorado affiliate, but we call it an affiliate of Yahad and Unum, which is Father Patrick Dubois' um, organization, an organization founded by him that is looking, and, and Todd can tell you more about it, but I, I want you to understand how cool it is because they go out to these little known former shtetls in Eastern Europe and they locate sites of mass murder. Um, so it's called the Holocaust by bullets. And um, we might be familiar with Einsatzgruppen, but these are also uh, the, the less familiar sites in some cases, some little tiny villages. And it's interesting because Todd, I'm speaking about you in the third person, what has been on these research trips where they actually interview people who lived in those villages at that time and witnessed the horrors of this, these murders. And it's fascinating because we always talk about losing survivors, but there's a whole nother set of witnesses who are still present. They're, um, they're uh, I always, whenever I see them in videos, they look really old, but sometimes they're in their seventies, right? They were young. So they're telling stories of things that they remember as, um, as, a, as a child. So I'm hoping Todd will share some of that with you, but I think it's giving attention to a whole nother set of, of crimes that take place during this time. It's not just, and we were talking about that last night. It's not just concentration camps and it's not just ghettos. It's communities. And, um, and so I hope he'll talk to you about that. And if you get an opportunity to attend one of the AHAD trainings, they are, um, or workshops, they are absolutely fascinating. The materials are great. And especially when they bring Todd working with one of the, the folks from the big kahuna, Yahad and Unum. Um, it, it's great because they talk about their experience out there in the field. And that kind of field research is always fascinating to me. So I thought how we would do it is I will kick it off with a little bit of an overview about what's happening with this Holocaust bill because I was, um, I was selected to be on the committee that is dealing with this new um, HB 201336. Um, and it's been a, a quite an interesting experience and I'm gonna be objective in what I, what I, what I share with you because I am, um, I'm a little bit jaded by my experience on that committee. But the bill was signed on um, July 8th, 2020. And so it makes Colorado, Todd, how many states have mandatory Holocaust education right now? 16 now. We just, uh, Arkansas just became a 16th a week and a half ago. So 16, and Todd is a, by the way, a all, all, all over the place with the USHMM, a museum teacher fellow, a regional rec, a, they have all kinds of initials. He's just, the, he's the bomb when it comes to Holocaust education in the state of Colorado, and I would say in the entire Rocky Mountain region. I would say in the entire world, but I don't want to be, you know, too much oh, yeah, overestimating. I don't want to put too much pressure on you, Todd. So anyway, Jared yeah. Cole signed the bill in July of 2020, and it's about teaching the Holocaust and genocide in the state of Colorado. So it requires that by July 1st, 2023, each school district's board of education incorporates academic standards and Holocaust and genocide studies into one existing course that is required for high school graduation. So it's not creating a new course, it's adding elements of Holocaust and genocide study into an existing course. Okay, so the committee was established and um, Todd sent me a link saying, hey, you should apply for this committee. I applied for this committee and that I'm still talking to Todd is a miracle. Um, the committee is established to identify the knowledge and skills students should acquire related to Holocaust and genocide studies. 
including, but not limited to, the Armenian genocide. So the fact that one genocide is named gives you a hint about how this bill seems to be the hobby horses of certain members of the, the community, especially in Denver. And the second one is that the Colorado Department of Ed will create and maintain a publicly available resource bank that pertains to Holocaust and genocide education. And we have to have that resource bank established by July of this year. So two mandates, identify the knowledge and skills and create a resource bank. So our committee has made recommendations on how to incorporate the knowledge and skills related to Holocaust and genocide into the existing social studies standards. And I will say that I fight in these meetings all the time because I also think English language arts standards should be included there, given that most English language arts teachers can spend two to three weeks on a novel like Night, and most social studies teachers get a couple days on the Holocaust. But I'm fighting a losing battle there. So, um, so we're talking our committee. Our first, we had two charges. One was come up with these standards, and the second was to develop a list of resources and a system for vetting them. So, in fact, our we have our one of our meetings is tomorrow night, so I would have more information then. And what happened was we came up with the standards, and they were made available to the public in March, and the the public could come back and respond. <clears throat> and then we members of the committee addressed some of those questions or issues raised that we thought were significant in a response document. And it was presented to the State Board of Education on the 15th of this month. So but I, I want, I don't know how many of you are teachers, but I want you to understand exactly what, it's, what it means for students in Colorado. <clears throat> so Colorado academic standards are what determine what is taught in each discipline area. And those standards are the basis of what is assessed on the state, on the state test. And so the standards have, are, are composed of a couple of components. One is called grade level expectations. The other one is called evidence outcomes. Evidence outcomes are the things that students should be able to do, having learned about this particular area. And then there are two, other, or two or three other areas that are called inquiry questions or context and connections. Now, none of the actual standards have been touched by this committee. The things that this committee has done is address um, inquiry questions and address these context questions. Teachers are only required to do the evidence outcomes, which are the skills they're supposed to teach. So in reality, a teacher could still teach their content without ever addressing Holocaust and genocide because the mandated part of the standards has been untouched except we'll, and we've added words like ethnic, or we've added uh, words like um, pluralism to some of the evidence outcomes. So essentially, it's not, it's not making as a significant an alteration in how students are taught. There's no consistent set of skills or content that is required. It's kind of haphazard in my opinion. I'm, I'm sort of, okay. I'm not quite sure what it's doing, but um, but that's what it's at. That's that's my perception of it, and I think it matters for those of us who are interested in this field of study, because if we think there's a reason for teaching the Holocaust, if we think that there's a reason for teaching genocide, if we think there's a larger purpose, those things are not what are what being addressed in this new law. What's being done is inserted examples that you can use. So if you have to talk to students about, um, about a grade level expectation that they will understand um, the nature of, of how various group identities are, are altered in conflict. We throw in there, some of the conflicts you could talk about are you know, the Holocaust. And so there's nothing that says they're going to learn that. And to me, it's a very, interesting approach, given how so many other states have very specific Holocaust-centric standards. Yeah, exactly. They're leaving it up to school districts to decide how to teach it. They're throwing in the standards and then teachers, Anastasia posted, then teachers are going to decide. The issue is, what do teachers know? 
And this is an unfunded mandate. So there's no money for training teachers. It's a resource bank, but how do teachers know how to use those resources? So these are the challenges. I'm in this group as a teacher educator. And I keep saying, you, teach, you, you, you can't throw stuff like this at teachers. You've got to give them training. And which is why my relationship with Todd is so important because I've brought Todd to campus multiple times to help train my teachers in how to teach the Holocaust. Otherwise you get bad Holocaust education and people teaching boy in a striped pajamas, which we all know they shouldn't be teaching. So those are the kinds of issues that, that I guess I share with you because I'm hoping that once this is established, perhaps our committee can, can offer some suggestions or make some comments about you know, what the next steps are gonna be in this project because they'll put the bill out there and they're going to have to come back and ask, how is it doing? Like, are these things being met? Because if, if high school students graduate and can't address these, these standards, it'll be a big mess for everybody. So it's, a re it's been a really interesting experience. Um, uh, listening to the State Board of Education, I've decided they should have nothing to do with education. But I think I might be the only person who thinks that. They should do something else. And educators should be talking about this. But it's, it's become a lot of people's personal, um, their, their personal interests, things that are interesting to them. And so anyway, so that's, that's what Holocaust Bill is. But that's why what Todd does yeah, and it's not, it's in social studies and US history, exactly. And it's, it's stuck in, it, 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 that's what it is. It's shoved in there and not thoughtfully addressed in how are their specific goals and objectives related to studying the Holocaust. It's how can we shove the Holocaust into history and social studies and civics and geography. So all of those areas, economics, all this sort of shoved in there. Um, and I can send you guys you know, what, the, what the working document is because it was made, it was made available to the public. So I, you know, I can think about doing that if you would like to. Um, no, I don't know how they're going to be tested, Nomi. Actually, I don't even know, right? Because all you've got to do is meet the evidence outcomes, which don't really have anything Holocaust or genocide specific in them. So yeah, it's a, it's a. The challenge. reality, the reality is they, they, they don't have that answer yet. And yeah. the discussions that I've been a part of outside of Jerry's committee meetings are realistically, if you, you know let's just say traditionally, stereotypically, you offer your Holocaust education course in April during Holocaust Remembrance Month week, Yom HaShoah, and a student is gone for a week, the student does not have to make up the work. And so therefore, you know, if a family takes an extended vacation for spring break, there's no, there's no requirement that they actually have to have the class or, or, or the, the the material that's being taught. And, and that's the, the, the difficult part. Um, my son is part of class of 2024, which means he will, it will be a high school graduation requirement for him. And he's taking his US history class next year as a sophomore, which will probably, as Anastasia said, will probably be where it's put in. And that's it. And, and we know that it's not gonna be in the class by next year because the curriculum, excuse me, the standards will not be finalized by the time the school year starts. So he will be required to have this class to graduate, but will never have to have the actual material involved. So that's so the shortcoming of, of this right now. Yeah, so we believe in it. Those of us who believe in the important, I'm not a big, I'm not, trust me, I'm not a huge fan of a mandate. I'm always anxious about mandates. I do believe in Holocaust education, which is different. And I just feel like it's an opportunity that we're not really exploiting. And I think, Nomi, you're right. I think it's a little bit of lip service to, to do this and it's a little bit frustrating. So I, you know, I, I hate to wish for something to fail, but I hope that when they do assess that it's not successful. So they have to come back and think about what it really means um, to think about Holocaust education. Um, so on that note, I'm gonna say that is why, again, what Todd does is so important for teachers. And if you know teachers or just your own edification, the workshops that he offers in his various capacities all bring it to the fore, make us think about it. And we think about it, not just in the context of a particular class, but we get the kinds of skills that allow us to think about it across our, our knowledge base, our interests. And to me, that's, that really matters. So I'm now gonna to toss it over to my very good friend, Todd. I call him, in fact, 
my husband Peter's walking around. I call him my Holocaust husband. This is my Holocaust husband, Todd. And I'm very fortunate to have him as my friend. So Todd, all G I'm gonna mute my microphone, but I will, but I will monitor the, um, the chat for anybody who has that. Okay. Um, so what, uh, what I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background um, to where we got to with this um, prior to the committee that Jerry worked on. The a mandate in Colorado has been discussed going back into the mid 1990s. In fact, right after Schindler's list came out, um, that was a discussion. At that point in time, there were, there were six states that had a Holocaust mandate and Colorado was, was looking to do the same thing. Um, you know, so for, for the past, you know, almost 25 years, uh, various reasons have happened as to why it wasn't taking place. Um, most of it had to deal with funding because everyone was in, agree in agreement over those, you know, 20 plus years is that if you're going to have a mandate that you had to train the teachers in order to do it. And the states that had mandates had some sort of, of teacher training involved. Um, but every single year we were told that no, it's not going to happen. There's no money um, for a number of different reasons. Um, obviously the events in Charlottesville back in 2017 uh, and the rise of anti-Semitism uh, and, and just flat out hatred over the past couple of years have really kind of ramped up uh, that discussion. There is a very significant uh, piece as to why it became very important here in Colorado, which I'll share with you in a moment, um, and also the complexities that come with that. So one of the struggles that we've had and we will continue to have is how do we look at the Holocaust? And the, the slide that you see right now with the six candles obviously is significant for a number of different reasons, um, but this is not just for commemoration. And uh, there's a slogan, obviously, never again. And unfortunately, uh, since the conclusion of World War II, since the conclusion of the Holocaust, the liberation of the camps, um, we've had multiple genocides uh, across the globe. And, and obviously the uptick in anti-Semitism, not just here in the United States, but abroad has, has created a lot of discussion uh, and a lot of consternation, if you will. So we have to look at this a little bit differently than just a commemoration. And unfortunately that slogan, never again, um, we're gonna have to take to a whole different level uh, at this point in time. So the, the key to all of this, and this was kind of mentioned in the chat box is we do not at this moment in Colorado, and, and I'm gonna be honest with you, I haven't seen it much in across this country and, and many of the other states that have mandates as well too. And there's uh, another 10 states that are lining up right now Arizona, Nebraska, um, Wisconsin, that are all looking at mandates as well too. Uh, and they're looking at what we've done here in Colorado because we're one of the more recent ones. Um, but the question is gonna be is how do we teach it? And whether you have curriculum or not, and Colorado will not have curriculum. There will not be a state sponsored, state mandated, state legislated, however you wanna put it, curriculum. It will be because we are local control. Um, it will be, up to the individual district, or in a case of site-based, it will be up to the individual school as far as what class they decide to put this requirement in for graduation, and then as far as what they're going to teach. Um, and so that's gonna make things a little bit more complex. So the reality of it is, is how do we then define the Holocaust? And we can take this in a couple of different ways, but quite simply, you know, what it comes down to at the very end of the day is people. And how are we gonna teach about the people? And we, we have a very large number that comes with this history, very large number, which we'll get to in a second. But the reality is that number is just way too large. And to try to convey that to a middle school student, which could be in the state of Colorado, fifth grade, that's the other complex part to this is it's just saying middle school and high school. It's not saying grade six, grade seven, grade eight. Um, and the reality is at the eighth grade level in middle school, there is nothing in the current standards, both language arts and social studies that really support a Holocaust unit. Language arts, definitely more than social studies, but definitely not social studies in eighth grade. So if you've got a middle school and there's a couple in the rural areas that have fifth grade students, we've, we've got some, some work to do. Okay, so we're going to come back to this slide with these three individuals here uh, in a moment and bringing it back down to the, the individual person. Um, but I mentioned to you, the reason why things got ramped up here in Colorado uh, in January of uh, 2020 um, was because of this. Uh, the first study, if you will, was done back in April of 2018. It was redone again last fall. 
And I'll be very honest with you, it was meant to scare the living snot out of all of us, where they said multiple generations in this country, not just millennials, not just Gen Ys, not just Gen Xs, but even baby boomers have no clue of what the Holocaust is. And that even a fair percentage, they called 10% a fair percentage of the people that were surveyed, and they did this by state, and the results are available by state, thought that the Jews caused the Holocaust to begin. So this really made people in the Holocaust education community um, on a couple levels, not all levels, very, very nervous. And the original uh, survey, if you will, going back to April of 2018, only asked three questions. And we didn't get to find out, and, and I know this because I inquired um, in a, through a couple of different avenues, we didn't get to find out how the, we knew what the question was, but we didn't get to know how the question was asked. Was it multiple choice? Was it short answer? Was it essay? Was it oral? Whatever the case may be. And so they asked these two questions and the results that we were given was less than 50%, in some cases, less than 30% of the respondents across multiple generation levels did not know the answer. So the first question was, how many Jews died in the Holocaust? That was the question. And they wanted a number. Now, depending on what organizations you follow, if you follow Yad Vashem or the USHMM or the ADL, you're going to get three very different numbers. If you're going with the current number that most historians are looking at as being a plausible number, it's going to surprise you. I'll share the number with you in a second, which is a lot different than what we've been hearing over the past 75 years. So that was question number one. Question number two was, how did Adolf Hitler come to power? And what we found out in the first week was the answer to the question that they asked, they actually had the answer wrong. And so once it was determined that they had the wrong answer, they had to change the answer. It kind of skewed the results um, and made things a little bit more complicated. Um, the last question was, what is Auschwitz? That question in itself <laughs> infuriated me to no end. Having been um, to Poland multiple times, more than two dozen times at this point, being an Auschwitz Jewish, um, Auschwitz Jewish Center fellow, Holocaust Museum fellow, having done some uh, extra work at the, Holocaust, at the Auschwitz Museum for some research I'm working on, that's not an easy answer. And if you were, asked to, were to ask graduate level students that question or professors, even if you were to ask survivors, what is Auschwitz, you are going to get a multitude of answers. And so what it ultimately came down to was the number 6 million. They wanted the number 6 million. Well, the ADL is the only organization at this point in time that looks at the number as being over 6 million. Every other institution that teaches the Holocaust or does Holocaust memorialization or research looks at the number being somewhere between 5.7 and 5.9. And so that number becomes kind of problematic. Then the most recent research, which I'm telling you about, which they're looking at it being very plausible, could exceed 7.5 million Jews and 15 million total victims, which then gets into a whole nother conversation of who do we include as other victims? And that gets to be very troublesome, especially in Auschwitz, when the gas chambers were originally designed for Polish political prisoners. They were not designed for Jewish prisoners. They were first tested on Soviet prisoners of war. So you have a really interesting conversation when you talk about Auschwitz and you talk about the seven gas chambers and you say, what was the purpose of the seven gas chambers? Depending on who you ask, you're going to get a different answer. And so does that make their answer wrong? And then the question about Hitler, you know, how does Hitler come to power? So what we do, and this, this is the Hitler complex that we have through all of this history, is what is Hitler actually responsible for? And I'm not trying to take responsibility away from him, but this one person does not cause this entire history. And if we're looking at the Holocaust as being the be-all, end-all when Hitler comes to power in January of 1933, we're missing centuries of pre-work that, that has to be placed in order for the Holocaust to occur. So if we're not teaching that, if all we're doing is teaching in our classroom that Hitler comes to power in 1933 and all hell breaks loose, then we, again, we have a very serious problem, both with a pedagogical approach and with the content itself. And so it becomes very, very problematic. And then again, with Auschwitz, I mean, heck, you can just talk about the three big camps. If we're talking about Elie Wiesel, Elie Wiesel, Wiesel spends time in Auschwitz one, the main camp, spends time in Birkenau. Actually, he gets processed in Birkenau. And then he finishes up his stay in Auschwitz at the Buna. Those are the three main camps. Then you have 47 sub camps, one of which is a fish hatchery. 
So I, I kind of joked, if I would have written my response as what is Auschwitz, and I would have said it's a fish hatchery in the suburb of Hermes, where six prisoners were employed to raise fish for dinner for the German soldiers, would I get the answer wrong? And nobody would respond to my question. So, and I realize I'm nitpicking when I get to this, but that's the complexity to this history. And that's why it's not so simple to just ask these multiple choice questions, if you will, and it really doesn't get anything for us. So bringing it back to this personal side is these three, three individuals right here represent so much with this history. And in, in all honesty, and I've done this a couple of times now, is I can, you can teach a whole Holocaust course depending on your rationale, depending on your objective by this one slide, because there's so much information that is here, okay? So the first part is the representation, there's three of them. What is the, popula the estimated population of Jews in Europe in 1938 by 1941 when Operation Barbarossa starts? It's roughly 9 million. How many of them are systematically murdered? Approximately 6 million, two out of three. Two out of the three of these young kids here do not survive the Holocaust. The Holocaust is not limited to just Germany. Not one of these individuals is born in Germany. Only one of these individuals actually spends time in Germany at the end and for less than a week, okay? So this gets to be a whole different complex complexity based on who we're talking about. So on the far left-hand side, that's Nessie Galperin. If you've ever been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC on a Monday, and up until the pandemic, it, it switched to Wednesdays, you probably heard Nessie laughing in the front foyer. Her laugh is loud, it's infectious, and it's unbelievably heartwarming. She was the first Holocaust survivor I ever met. And she's an absolute treasure, by all means. She's still with us today. We're friends on Facebook. Um, I haven't talked to her in a while, but um, she's doing wonderful. So she's from Lithuania. So she's going to be sent to a ghetto. She's going to be sent to a death camp. Um, in a roundabout way, not the traditional six that we talk about. And then she's gonna be put on a death march, okay? So pretty significant history that we very rarely talk about in our classrooms, especially a middle school classroom. I'm not gonna spend time as a middle school teacher, and I taught middle school for 10 years, talking about the death marches when I only have two class periods, 90 minutes to teach this. And unfortunately, that's the time frame in which some of our teachers have. Then you have Nadine in the middle who, was born in France, but her parents were born, both born in Russia. So she's considered a foreign Jew in France. So she's gonna be rounded up very early after the occupation, and she's gonna be deported to Auschwitz. The significance of this is she's sent to Dronsey with her mother. Her father is, is uh, murdered before they even get to Dronsey, but she's gonna be placed on one of those trains, which is only children. They are separated from their parents in Dronsey. Mom gets sent first. She's left in Dronsey with other children her age and even younger, some of them down to less than a year. They will then be shipped on separate transports into Auschwitz and murdered upon um, their arrival. And then Edict on the far right, he's in present day Ukraine. His parents are part of uh, basically a traveling um, entertainment company for the Red Army, uh, a circus if you will. So he's staying with his grandmother and they're gonna be rounded up. They're gonna be sent to a ghetto. You cannot think of this as a ghetto like Warsaw or um, Ludge or Krakow or Tarnoff. This is a ghetto specific to the Soviet territories that are established in some cases for less than 10 hours. So he's gonna be sent to a ghetto and then he's gonna be taken out into the forest and he's gonna be shot in a mass action. So these three individuals give us a great perspective on the complexity, the size of this event and the different avenues that we're talking about. It's not just in Germany, it's not just in Poland. You don't see um, some of the normal discussions that we have based on their experiences. And so this is where we need to be focusing on if we're wanting to go in this historical route, the, the breadth of it, if you will. But again, when you've got two class periods or three, depending on the situation, this comes a little bit more difficult. When we get back to the conversation about Hitler, um, this is a very famous photograph taken in June of 1941, just after Operation Barbarossa started. This is in the Kovno ghetto. 50 Jews from Kovno are going to be beaten to death with lead pipes while the Germans watched. No Einsatzgruppen forces, no police battalions were involved in this. These are local nationalists, pro-German, Lithuanian nationalists who are going to be a part of this. So when we focus so much of our time and effort on Hitler and what Hitler did or didn't do, 
we're missing the amount of collaboration. We're missing the bigger picture of who these perpetrators are and what was their reason behind it. And yes, unfortunately, the purpose behind it does matter because obviously what we're seeing today in our society and what's taking place is this thought process of ultra nationalism, this, this um, us better than them, you know, that kind of situation. These are the same themes. These are the same discussions that were taking place in the 1930s, not just in Germany, but in almost every one of the countries in Europe as well, too. And if all we're doing is focusing on one person, on Hitler, we're missing an, an opportunity to change what's going on today, and we're not making it relevant. And so we can't ask questions, when does Hitler come to power, and how does Hitler come to power? And the part that's really fascinating is, is most people think Hitler came to power democratically. Well, how are you going to describe or define democratically? Hitler was appointed. He was never elected. And so that makes a whole nother complex, uh, complexity that we, in a lot of cases, have a hard time to even discuss because we're not prepared for it. Imagine taking your Holocaust class before you take a government class. So now you're having to teach government before you're actually teaching, or you're having to teach the Holocaust before you actually teach government. And last time I was in a classroom, the civics courses were being taught at the junior and senior level because of you know, the significance of it. And, and that was the only mandate in Colorado up until 2019 was a civics requirement that you had to have a civics class in order to graduate from high school, okay? And then the last question, you know, what is Auschwitz? I will tell you right there in front of you that green little pasture is the most destructive 20 yards in all of Auschwitz. More people were killed within those trees than any other location in Auschwitz. And it's not even inside the camp perimeter. It is not part of the regular tour. When students go to Auschwitz to walk down the Hungarian ramp to see the rail car, to see gas chamber crematoria number two and three, they do not come within a half mile of this location because it's not taught, because there's nothing there. We are so fixated on these physical monuments and memorials that we sometimes forget the history. The reason why this becomes significant, this is a computer generated image. This is the little red house, bunker number one. Of the 1 million Jews who were killed at Auschwitz, at least 250,000, if not 350,000, were gassed in that building. It was divided up into two um, gas chambers and they were brought in between 1942 and 1944. The only reason why we discuss so much about gas chamber crematories number two, three, four, and five is because of the Hungarian Jews that came in in 1944. And so all those people who are going to Auschwitz and saying Kaddish, and as they should, unfortunately, the majority of the victims are not at the location where they're doing Kaddish. And for some people, that's very significant. Um, and so that becomes a real troublesome piece. What's really kind of interesting about this is this picture. I took this photograph uh, just last, uh, 2019, is on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side behind those trees are two homes. The home on the left-hand side, there's a swing set just on the other side of those trees. And again, this is on the outside of the camp perimeter. And yet we don't have discussions about this. Now, should we have this discussion with a seventh grade history class? Probably not. But are we actually understanding the concept of what Auschwitz is to properly teach it in our classrooms? And, and that's a question, again, if we're not having teacher trainings, then we're kind of missing some things here. So in order for us to go anywhere with this is we have to have a working definition. And unfortunately, right now, with our state mandate and with the way the, the standards are being put together, and Jerry, please correct me if I'm wrong on this, we haven't even defined the Holocaust yet, have we? It's nowhere in our legislation to even define the Holocaust. To me, that's a problematic piece. Um, and what becomes even more difficult or actually wonderful, if you will, and pardon the expression, is Yad Vashem has a different definition. So just having that discussion in class, why does the USHMM have one definition? Why does Yad Vashem have another definition? And then you really wanna put some complexity to it is then you throw in the Imperial War Museum out of London. And so these are discussions that we should be having in our classrooms to actually define the event that we have a mandate on. And yet this is not a requirement. So quite honestly, and, and I realize I'm being kind of sarcastic here when I say this, you could teach a Holocaust unit in the state of Colorado, meet the mandate and never define the Holocaust. That's where we're sitting right now, unfortunately. That recommendation has been given numerous times. It was given as the bill was being put together. It was never followed through on. Another definition which we were hoping to get put in there is anti-Semitism. And the EIHR has an amazing definition of anti-Semitism, which is 
a totally appropriate for today. And that also was not included in this. So it is going to be our mission to make sure that these are all readily available for teachers to have in their hands at their disposal, whether they're teaching language arts or social studies or science. We have a couple of science teachers who are teaching this um, uh, art, music, et cetera. So again, we have the definitions to work with. The reason why the definition becomes so important is because of this. Are the Holocaust is the Holocaust by definition and the final solution interchangeable? Are they the same thing? And we'll have people who tell you that they're the, they are the exact same thing. Unfortunately, by definition, they are not the exact same thing. The final solution in reality refers to one phase of the Holocaust and that is the systematic murder. We truly do not see the final solution until June 22nd, 1941. Now you can make an argument going back to T4, but you're not gonna see the final solution in 1933. You're not gonna see it in 1935 and you're not gonna see it at Kristallnacht, which are all, and 35 is, is the significance of the Nuremberg laws. Those are all key components of the Holocaust and you have to teach those things, but it's not all the final solution. And so this is the work that we have cut out for us to make sure that we're getting, um, getting these teachers prepared for July 1st, 2023 in order for this to go live. Uh, so rationale for teaching the Holocaust, what is it? And each teacher, as it was said, each teacher is going to have to, at this point, have their own rationale, unless the district is going to provide that for them, or if, uh, if it's site-based, if the school's going to um, provide that for them. Up, in the, up until this point, we haven't really had a rationale for teaching the Holocaust, um, per se, in, in the state. And so depending on what your level of uh, knowledge or um, comfortability with teaching, it would probably be where your rationale was based upon. So what we've been trying to do for the past 20 years is to share the USHMM's rationale um, with teachers and recommending this. We don't require this. In fact, no one's requiring this, but this is the recommendation for teaching the Holocaust and the rationale behind it. And all of this is available on the USHMM's website. Um, feel free if you want to let me know. I can email this to you. This is very simple stuff. Um, and what it is that, you know, we're wanting to do with this. Okay. Why are we teaching it? And, and, and what are we going to do with the information or the results? How are we going to gauge if learning actually took place? Okay. In addition, and this is the part down there at the bottom that we really want to focus on is that individual teacher's knowledge. We would love to take every single middle school and high school teacher that teaches the Holocaust in Colorado, we'd love to take them to Europe and not just to Auschwitz, but to multiple places. Um, and, and you can see pre-Holocaust Jewish life. Jerry and I were very fortunate. Uh, her in 2014, me in 2015, we spent a month in Poland and it was an eye opener, a game changer, because I would say easily half of the misconceptions I had about the Holocaust were, <laughs> were either destroyed or solidified just by this one trip. And, and yes, we went, to, we spent a week at Auschwitz, but we also were in Dielzitz, we were in Chelmnik, we were in a bunch of other little loca locations that you never would have heard of. Um, we find out that 90% of the pre-Holocaust synagogues are still standing in Poland. They're just being used for other things. And when you see these buildings, some of them are vacant, some of them are museums, and some of them are private homes now. And those are those kind of things that we would love to get into the hands of teachers. And again, we'd love to take them over there. Then you get a situation where you have a mass execution site of a small town, Mazana Dolna, just south of Krakow, 881 Polish Jews are going to be assassinated in the span of two and a half hours. And they are literally 45 minutes from Auschwitz. Why were they not taken to Auschwitz? And, and that's a question of a lot of different answers to go with that. And so that, that, that thought process that every single Jew was put on a train and sent to Auschwitz to meet up with Dr. Mengele just is not true, even the ones that lived very, very close. Um, and then we're in a small village called Bedzin, which I'll show you in a second. And we see the home of the Polish Anne Frank. And you are gonna possibly be disgusted when you see what her home looks like today as opposed to what the Anne Frank house looks like in Amsterdam, okay? So in addition to that, we have some examples of rational statements. I'm obviously not gonna read these to you, um, but there's a lot to go with this. This is only a sum of them. I mean, so there's so much more behind this and so much more that we're wanting to get to these teachers. Um, and, and us ourselves, I mean, I'm still learning. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time now and I, I swear I'm learning something new every single day. And so there's no way that we can expect teachers to think that they have it all at this point in time. Uh, but there are so many available 
uh, resources and means to make this happen. And, and our goal is to make sure that it does. Okay. And then we get into the guidelines. If you've ever taken a US HMM course, you've talked about these 10 guidelines. And these are significant. You know, again, the top one, the very first thing you should always do when you're teaching the Holocaust, define the Holocaust. What is the definition of the Holocaust? That goes without saying. You know, the Holocaust was not inevitable. It wasn't going to happen just because. But some other key ones that are in there, and I'm not going to touch on all of them, but a couple, precision of language. Precision of language is huge. What is a concentration camp by definition? Now, do we have to get into class one, class two, class three? No. Is Auschwitz a killing center or a concentration camp? And the answer is yes, it's both. It's also a transit camp. And so that gets to be hard. Now, what really gets to be complex is when you sit down with a survivor and you talk about the six killing centers in Poland and that survivor was at Dachau and says, oh, I was at the killing center of Dachau. How do you tell a survivor that Dachau was not a killing center? It's got a gas chamber. It was never used to kill people. It's got a crematoria and people died there. So we have to be very, very careful with our language um, and, and how we're defining these things. Um, statistics into people, obviously that's huge. And that's you know, at the beginning, I'm showing you the three pictures uh, of Nessie, uh, Nadine and Etik, because we, we want the names. We want to be able to say who these people are. And then the last one most definitely is the method, uh, methodological choices. Don't be doing a simulations. Don't be putting train cars on the floor in your classrooms. Don't be asking kids to go home and spend the weekend in their closets so they know what Anne Frank felt like. And unfortunately, in 2021, we still know that there are some educators across the country who are doing just that still because they want their students to get it. I'm 50 years old. I still don't get it. I don't know what it is when it comes to the Holocaust. Um, and that's going to be a moving target for a lot of different reasons as we start to learn more and experience more with this history. What we try to tell teachers is, is to keep these three things in mind always when you're teaching this. What's your content? You know, if your content is night, fantastic. But unfortunately, night is a very specific piece in time. So we've got to do pre-war Siget. We've got to do Elie Wiesel's experience and then what happens afterwards. Or if we're talking about any of the execution sites in Eastern Europe, what is the context? From what perspective are we coming from? Are we coming from the person that experienced it? I can't tell you how many times I've sat with survivors who have been given presentations or are with us and a student comes up and says, hey, you're a Holocaust survivor. Can you tell me about this and that? And the survivor says, well, I don't know that. That's not my experience. And, I'll, you know, and the people are kind of deflated, like, oh, well, I thought you would know everything. It gets to be a little bit <laughs> of an issue at that point. And then the complexity. How complex are we going to make this? For a seventh grader, do we really need to talk about why they were put into groups of five? Is that really important? Do we really need to talk about what Zyklon B does? Do we really need to talk about what it's like to be starving? I have no context for what starving looks like. I can't even imagine to even try to try to explain that to a student. Um, and so is that our job? So we then bring it into what does the Holocaust look like? This is uh, Rutka Laskier's home in Bedzin, Poland. The window in the middle was her bedroom. She is considered the Polish Anne Frank. She wrote a diary. The crazy part is she was born the exact same day, June 12th, the exact same year, 1929, as Anne Frank. Up until right now, how many of you have heard of Rutka Laskier? There are no lines at the front of this apartment building, which is abandoned, has been abandoned since, 19, since the 1940s. There is no museum. There is no national curriculum to teach Ruth Kalaski year. And yet we're not talking about that. And so that is another piece. Whose perspective are we coming from? How many of these can we do? And so there's a lot of resources out there just besides Anne Frank. Um, and do we have to do all of them? We can't do all of them, but we have other options as well too. Probably one of my most favorite and the most disturbing pictures I've ever taken. This is Skeeta Beach in Latvia. I am standing about three feet in front of a mass grave of about 2,700 Jewish men, women, and children who were massacred on December 15th through 17th, 1941. That's the Baltic Sea right there in front of you. So we're talking about Latvia, we're talking about 1941. Auschwitz is open, but they're not gassing victims at this point in time, okay? Pearl Harbor had just happened a week and a half before, a week before this. 
And so how does this fit into the narrative? How does this fit into the history? And then how do you take something like this where you can go today and share this with your students? Should you share this with your students? And, and you know, that, that's yet another piece to this puzzle of how important what we're doing with this standard becomes is how we present this information. Or then you take a picture like this. This is Treblinka. Okay. And Treblinka was torn down by the Nazis in 1943. Um, and, you know, the one the, the, we could talk for hours about Treblinka, but we'll throw one piece to this. Do we talk about the snow? <laughs> what was it like to be in Treblinka in the winter? And if you ever spent a winter in Poland, I don't know how anybody survived. It, it just baffles me. And so it's the sheer human will to survive. So we focus so much on this 6 million number how much do we focus on the 3 million that survived? And that gets to be a question that we should be asking teachers and asking our students as well. That is a, an amazing life lesson, is to how do you find the will to survive or the means to survive? I have yet to come across a Holocaust survivor that did not somewhere in their narrative tell me that the only reason why they're alive is because someone in a German uniform helped them. I'm not kidding. I'm talking hundreds of survivors at this point in time, some way, shape or form. And it could be, have been the smallest thing to where the German just turned their back and didn't do something, as opposed to some of them who actually left food or put them on a, a particular truck that they you know, normally wouldn't have gotten onto or anything along those lines. We don't talk about that enough. It becomes that elephant in the room, if you will. Voice is a huge part of this history. It's a gigantic part. Whose voice are we using? And so this makes people uncomfortable because we want to talk about the victims. We want to give the victims voice and we, we have to give the victims voice 100%. But we also have to have voice from other participants as well too. We have to tell the story from the perpetrator perspective, the collaborator perspective. And now what we're working on uh, with Yahada Noonan specifically is the witness perspective. What did the witness see? And a witness is a lot different than a bystander. How do you call a seven-year-old a bystander? when they sat and they watched a mass execution. You know, in my world, I work professionally as a firefighter full-time. Bystanders are someone who drives by a car accident and is not paying attention to the road. There's no negative connotation to that. When you talk about the Holocaust and you mention the word bystander, there's people who want to put them in the same group as collaborators and perpetrators. That, well, if you didn't do anything, then you did something. Ooh, that's a tough conversation to have, especially if you're talking about France versus Denmark versus Poland. Those are three very different places to be a bystander. And those are the conversations that we, we should be having as well too. Who are our victim groups? Obviously you cannot have the Holocaust without Jewish victims. It doesn't happen. You take Jews out of the equation and there is no Holocaust. Can you take out Soviet prisoners of war and have a Holocaust still? Yes. Can you take out Poles? Yes. Handicapped? Yes. Okay. Jews are not the first victims to be sent to concentration camps and Jews are not the first victims to be systematically murdered but they are the largest victim group and they were targeted from start to finish. And so of course we have to talk about that, but we also have other victim groups that were targeted along the way and for very different reasons and sometimes for a very short time, um, but those conversations need to be had. Geography plays a huge part to this. If we're talking about 1940s France versus 1939 Estonia, we have two different very <laughs> conversations. I was in Latvia in 2019 and we interviewed a witness whose father fought for the Tsar during World War I. Uh, when the Soviets came in in 1939, they executed his father as being a, uh, a non-communist sympathizer. And so when the Germans came in in 1941, what does he do? He sides up with the Germans because the Germans are viewed as his liberator. By the end of the war, he's been taken prisoner by the Soviets. He gets turned back, and now he's driving the, the Germans out of Latvia by 1944. I mean, it's a fascinating story, but he's on both sides. And his motivations are clear both times. And so where does he fall? Is he a perpetrator? Is he a collaborator? Is he a liberator? I mean, again, that terminology gets to be huge. When we try to break this down, one of the more um, recent breakdowns I see with this history is, is teaching the four E's is that we did not have killing centers in 1933. The first goal of the Nazis, and we know this, there is no dispute to this, the first goal of the Nazis was to exclude Jews from normal German life, to make it so uncomfortable that they would leave. And Anne Frank's family, Otto Frank, is the perfect example of this. 
by the summer of 1933, he's packing up the family and they're moving out. That's what the Germans wanted. They wanted all the Jews of Germany to leave. When they didn't leave fast enough, they start to get expelled. And so when you look at um, Herschel Greispen, who is blamed for starting Kristallnacht, going into the embassy in France and shooting the German uh, officer, he's upset because his parents were being expelled back to Poland. He was born in Germany. He considers himself to be German, but his parents are being expelled deported back to Poland. So he's upset. He goes to France and he, he assassinates a German officer. Then Kristallnacht happens. So there's the expulsion part. Exploitation, this is a bigger piece. It's not just working slave labor in the in the concentration camps. It's taking German property, or excuse me, Jewish property in Germany. It's taking their belongings. It's taking away their education. It's taking away their professions. The exploitation piece is a much bigger piece. And then finally, we get to the final solution to the Jewish question, which is the systematic murder, which is extermination. So what we're recommending and, and seeing a lot more is that units are being put together under these four E's, is explaining what the exclusion looked like, then explaining the expulsion, you get the idea. Now, this may not work for everybody. So one of the more common ones after this is you break it down into these five, five themes, is you have to teach what pre-1933 looked like. Uh, in Europe. And that means going back a couple hundred years. If you're not looking at the Versailles Treaty, you should probably re-examine your lesson plan. If you're not talking about the Dreyfus Affair in France in the 1870s, you might want to re-examine your, your lesson plan. If you're not going back to pogroms, you're not going back to Lutheranism, there's a lot of discussions that need to be taking place long before Hitler and the Nazis ever come about. Then you have Germany in the 1930s, specific to what's taking place in Germany, but being very cognizant of what's happening around. World War II begins. So does the Holocaust start World War II or does World War II start the Holocaust? That's a great question that people like to ask. Then you get into the final solution with Operation Barbarossa. Remember that's taking place before all the killing centers are online. And then you have the liberation and the aftermath. Displaced persons camps are open longer than the concentration camps. How many classroom teachers are talking about displaced persons camps? Now, if that's not fitting into your scope and sequence, that's fine but we at least have to build the groundwork up to liberation and what takes place with at least the first three years afterwards. Do they just automatically all go home and everything's fine and dandy? <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And so that's what we have to look at, okay? Part of this too is, is taking the then and the now. Um, and, and again, would love to take teachers on all these trips, but these places are real. And we have virtual tours of just about, well, a lot of the, uh, locations. Now, Auschwitz has a great um, virtual tour. The Poland Museum does a virtual tour. There's not much to see in Warsaw because 99% of it was destroyed. Um, but you have places like this, which is the Umschlagplatz. This is the deportation center to Treblinka. So, you know, over 270,000 Warsaw Jews on the left-hand side are going to be at the Umschlagplatz, put onto a train and sent to uh, Treblinka. And that's what it looks like today on the right. And so balancing that effort between the then and the now is, is something that we're going to need to do as well. Uh, I am very passionate about this after seeing this firsthand. I, I'm really upset that we have just put this into the social studies curriculum. I think that's actually a very bad thing. Um, you cannot teach the Holocaust from just a historical perspective. Um, it has to be taught through literature. It has to be taught through art. It has to be taught through music. It has to. And we're doing a really big disservice to the history, to the victims by not including all of that because those parts were so important in their life as well too. If you're not familiar with this drawing, this is from Marion Kolgitz. This is called The Labyrinth. Um, Jerry and I were introduced to his artwork um, in a monastery just south of Birkenau. Um, this is a gentleman who survived Birkenau, obviously, survived Auschwitz, has a stroke, and after his stroke, I mean, this is for, he had a stroke in the early 90s, he starts drawing, and so his tattoo number was 432, which you see on the, fore, on the, the forehead of that gentleman, that's him as a youngster, and then that's him underneath, and he's writing down all of the numbers that he could remember of the prisoners that he served with. That's just one piece of the artwork. There's over a thousand drawings in this um, uh, display that's absolutely unbelievable. And it, I, I, you could teach a whole class just off of this one guy's experience on so many different levels. Then you get into the art um, in, in many of the camps. You get into the music. I mean, the music of the Ludge Ghetto, why we're not talking about that. The music of the, the 
the Raisenstadt ghetto. I mean, the list goes long, on and on. Um, so I think we're doing a really large disservice to students uh, in Colorado by just putting it into one curriculum. And the last photo I want to leave you with, and we can open up to questions, is, you know, again, what is our purpose? And we, we don't necessarily want kids, I don't, I'm just going to bring this back to me, is the Holocaust is not just death. The Holocaust is life um, on so many different levels. Now, obviously, it's definitely about death. And, and there's so many different unbelievable ways that death takes place during the Holocaust, but it's also life. This picture right here is taken in Birkenau. This rose, along with 12 of its brothers and sisters, is growing out of one of the ash pits in Birkenau. So this is a hole that was dug on purpose where ashes were dumped after they brought out of crematorias four and five. Today, because people have brought roses to Birkenau to lay at certain uh, locations, the um, seeds, if you will, made their way to this ash pit and every year these roses grow. About five minutes after I took this photograph, three deer ran in front of me through Birkenau. There's life at Birkenau today. We focus a lot on the death as we should, but we should also focus on the life. And so those are those things that we're hoping through education, through the resource bank, even if we can't get it into the standards, even if we can't get school districts to decide to put together a curriculum because the state's not gonna do it, we can at least get to the teachers in the classrooms, no matter what subject they're teaching and get, this, get them this information so that they can teach this appropriately and be comfortable doing it. And then hopefully, I mean, as it did for me is, you know, if I become a better Holocaust educator, it made me a better educator with everything because of the empathy, because of the tolerance, because of the knowledge that you have to have to go through all of this um, is so important. So I'm going to stop there. I noticed that we did not have um, an ending time. <laughs> um, it just said we start at seven. So with that, uh, now, if you've got questions, by all means, please. Um, and uh, we can go from there. Jerry, thoughts? Did I miss anything? <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. Last night, um, we talked about survival in Auschwitz. And the cold is such an important part of, um, of that story, right? This, I mean, he's dealing with the cold. And Barry was there, and we were talking a lot about you know, this idea of the art of survival. And I think that that, when you were talking about Treblinka, I could only think about that. But I think you've pointed out the complexity and, and think I'm, I just keep thinking about teachers and how are they even gonna know where to begin? How are they gonna know where to begin with this and where to insert and how we find time? And that's the question that I keep asking at these meetings. It's like, how are they gonna do it? Is anybody thinking about the teachers we're frustrated by the fact that they teach Anne Frank over and over again. Anne Frank, night, mouse. I mean, that's the text that they read. And that's because that's what they know. And I don't begrudge any student teaching the text that they know. I mean, any teacher doing that because they're so overloaded. But if we're not going to give them time to really investigate things, what are we getting out of it? And that's, I, I kept saying at the first meeting, why do we want to have this mandate? I need to understand what the end is. I In lesson planning and teaching, we talk about backwards design. We start from the end. What is it that we want to accomplish? And then we build our instruction to get us to that point. And no one can tell me. We have a mandate. That's all I keep getting. And that's, a very, that's frustrating to me. And so on the one hand, it's, it's good that we're placing this in um, we're, we're having this conversation. We're not going to, I just don't, you made a point about how relevant it is to now. And, and Todd knows me well enough to know that that's my hobby horse. What do we take from our study of this to help us live in the world today? I beat that point up all the time. We don't, we don't, no one's talking about that. It's like, what little things do we have to do? We've got somebody who represents the Armenian genocide and he wants to make sure we've got another woman whose mother is a, was a survivor and she's got, her, everybody's got their agenda and the agenda for the larger world seems to be lost. So, and I think you've covered that you, I mean, well, think about all that you just talked about and how much it takes. If we believed in Holocaust education that much, we'd mandate a class. 
you know, it's as simple as that. So I, I think, Nomi, you said somewhere, it's like we want to sort of salve our conscience by doing this. And well, that, that's been, I can tell you in, in, in my experience with the Colorado Holocaust educators for the past three years, um, the misconception out there is when someone hears that, there, that Colorado did not have a mandate to teach the Holocaust, there was a, a very significant amount of people who thought that it was not being taught at all. It was a zero sum. Mm -hmm. That in order for the Holocaust to even be taught in a Colorado school, there had to be a mandate. So we had to do a lot of education saying, no, <laughs> there's some very knowledgeable, very experienced, very good teachers out there. And they're also teaching the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the first step. And then we've got some national organizations who, who have the best interest in heart, at heart. They really truly want to do the right thing. But it comes down to, well, why isn't Colorado in the top 10? Well, we can't be, we can't be you know, over 20. We've got to get it done now. And so for a while there, I was getting phone calls weekly of why was I not supporting a mandate? And it's like, well, wait a second. Those are two different things. Mm -hmm. Supporting a mandate and supporting Holocaust education should be the same thing, but they don't have to be the same thing. And so we've been supporting Colorado or Holocaust education for 20 plus years. We don't support legislation that really doesn't help us teach the Holocaust. And that's been, you know, unfortunately that falls on deaf ears more often than not. Um, and, and I understand, I mean, there, people have said, we, we, they wanted to get this done before last survivor passed away. And I understand the significance of that. I get it, I truly do. But I don't know that we're doing it the right way. The, the, the only saving grace we have is that, you know, if the standards aren't right the first time, we can, they can be rewritten. They don't happen right, right away, but there will be a revision. The resource bank will be a living document. If something goes on the resource bank that proves not to be of value, then we can take it off and put something on there that is of value. So we still, I mean, it's, it's not a be all end all at this point. It's just gonna be a work in progress, unfortunately. But no matter what we do, we've got to get education to the teachers. And our biggest struggle is, I mean, and I'm not in the classroom full time, but we've got too many individuals in the community um, and at certain levels in education that say, well, they, they can take classes at night. They can take classes on the weekend. <laughs> I left teaching for the fire service because it was safer to go to the fire service. And so, you know, to ask teachers to add three more hours to their day to, for one class that they teach is just too much. And so we ask, you know, we'll put the training on during school hours, get them a sub. And of course, what do we get? There's no money available for substitute teachers. And, 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 and that's, that's a constant. And, and that's so, why you've worked with me with pre-service teachers, thinking if we send young teachers out there, and you know, one of the things that, that I think about as I'm looking at your presentation and I'm thinking about so many different components of it is that we're not doing what we do in education and I'm gonna use it vertically aligning so that if we want students to really understand the Holocaust and genocide, then there are things we can start with in sixth grade, the stories of children. And then each year we build on that, right? We say, okay, then in sixth grade, you're going to do this and in seventh grade as opposed to you're going to read Anne Frank you're going to read night and that's going to be in lit in language arts anyway and it's not going to be contextualized or placed in any kind of historical you know it play you know the history around it and this idea of um we don't want to we don't want to fatigue students because you'll hear that I had to get it every year but if there was some sort of coherent um accretion of understanding then by the time they are in uh, juniors and seniors then they can begin to think about the place of this, what they're learning in the world and then their position in the world. But, um, but it, it, I, I wrestle with it. I truly do with you know, sending students out to teach this. And on this committee, I wrestle with it because everything that you talked about tonight, stuff I know, stuff I always learn again when you do it, stuff I forget, there's so many elements of it that we could teach if teachers were well-trained. If we invested in training teachers, you could give them the standards and they could teach how some, they, they could do it without us telling them how, if that makes sense. I prepare English language arts teachers and I tell them, I'm teaching, I'm preparing you to teach any content. My job is to give you the skills to teach. And then I hope that if, I, if you get a novel that you don't know, you should be able to teach it. If we gave them enough Holocaust education then they might be able to make wiser choices. But right now we're not funding any education. It's an unfunded mandate. And as a result, they're gonna be, 
you know, flailing in the dark or going on and just looking for canned lessons. And canned lessons don't work because the, te the students are individuals. So, you know, I, this is, but this is, I will be saying all of this again tomorrow night at the, the meeting because I say it every time and they mute me. So, but are there any questions from anybody who would like to, you know, raise some questions or get some follow up from Todd or are there any resources that you would like? Barry? Yeah, I have a, a couple of comments. Uh, it, it seems to me everything you said is, is very good. I was uh, very pleased with what you what you said, Todd. If I may call you Todd. Well, of course. Uh, sir. Uh, I taught a class at the university on the Holocaust, and everything that you said, I tried to do. Uh, was I successful? I, I don't know, but. One of the things I think that you, that you might consider, Jerry, you too, is that one of the objectives of teaching is that a student emerges from a class more knowledgeable than when he or she entered the class. So if a student is exposed tonight and that's the best he can do, well, that's the best he can do, uh, unless, unless you're going to plow a lot of money into this whole operation. And we know that's not going to happen. Uh, and I think that you have, to, you have to put this into context. Context, meaning, well, you know, the Holocaust is important. It's important to all of us. That's why we're here. But, but so is the American Revolution important. Uh, and, and so is the British Revolution. And so is the French Revolution. These are all important and deserve some time. I almost laughed when Todd said, well, they got, they got a portion of a portion of a curriculum to do it. Well, that's crazy. That's crazy. You know, how do you do that? I spent 15 weeks talking about this <laughs> and, and I, I try to do my best, but I, I'm sure that I did a disservice to my students because I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I, I got emotionally involved. Yeah. Uh, and that's a problem with this subject. I don't get emotionally involved with the French Revolution. It's too <laughs> far away. I don't know anyone who participated, but I do know who participated in the, in the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. I have a niece who married a survivor's son. So I, I've seen that. I've been to Poland. I've been to the camps. And unless you're going to somehow uh, open up the doors to the teachers uh, to provide resources, and you're trying desperately to do this. I know that, but it doesn't work. So maybe, maybe you have to take half the loaf. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what you have to do. You know, years ago, I had a professor, I remember, who said, if someone says to you, I don't got a pencil, what do you do? Give him a pencil. Give him a pencil. Ask him why he didn't bring a pencil to class. No, you give him a pencil. <laughs> But, you know, Barry, that's such an important point. And one of the things that I've been thinking about as you were talking with this and as Todd was talking about it is that this idea that perhaps maybe rather than giving them just these links to resources, if we understand what they are teaching or their level of knowledge, yeah. that we give them framed out materials, you know, like, you know, the way Echoes and Reflections does a lesson that I don't like canned lessons, but a, enough of a bare boned one on all of these various topics on expulsion, on extermination, that they can then um, make their own based on who their students are or other things that they're reading or connections that they can make. And we give them something to start with while we try to begin to implement some sort of system of education where we make it optional, you know, a, a one hour class every, you know, in this you know, that's what, the challenge. You, you have to, Todd, you, you're, 
I don't think you're really seeing a lot of what's going on. You know, when I, when I would have this class, when I would give this class, two thirds of these kids didn't know what the Holocaust was. And, and a third of that didn't want to know what it was. The class was convenient right. for them. Okay. Uh, right. I had classes. Well, and that's, I, yeah, I'm that's sorry. No, 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 that's that's a fantastic point because the, the the mandate specifically says middle school and high school, and so what should be happening in theory is exactly what you just said is that when we have them in middle school and schools in Colorado, should that be that early introduction? So by the time they get to that high school level, then we can start to do a little bit more, and so that's kind of the, again we're focusing so much in this high school graduation, we're not focusing on the yeah. actual education itself. That's, and that's, that's, that's another. It. We're not focusing on education. Correct. That's the problem. Yeah. That's. Yes. So it's not yeah. money, but it's how the money is being used, uh, and and the problem, and the problem to a large degree is what Jerry said. Everybody has their own case, you know. You know, I had Correct. a, you know, and I, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. The, the Holocaust Museum is in charge of the Never Again Act. They have the money that goes with that. And so just last week, the Holocaust Museum released two lesson plans, a lesson plan if you have one hour to teach the Holocaust and a lesson plan if you have three hours. And it's truly not a lesson plan. It's actually three objectives and six objectives to cover. Yeah. And so we're starting to see this. And we've talked about this in Colorado, but the only problem that, one of the problems that we have is until we can talk with every single school district, which is 177, to find out what class they're putting in first. If we can find out what class they're putting in at what grade level, then we can start to work around what curriculum they currently have. And then we can start to, to go from there, but that's gonna, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine how long that's gonna take. And one of the so, things we did is in that committee, we broke it up. So some people took the sixth grade standards, some took the seventh, some took the eighth, and some took sixth grade geography, six. And so, yeah, it's all over the place. And that's exactly it. And that's why I wanted to, I kept saying, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? And then where is the best place to educate students towards these ends? Yeah. And it's like every, so exactly. And it's not as if we're getting all of the, the school districts or all the school boards in a room saying, okay, let's pick the classes. And then we could actually have a chance of educating. But you know, I get it in sixth grade and I hope you remember it to graduate or you might. And so that, that this is, so you see my frustration with, um, as someone who thinks about what teachers need, but, um, but yeah, we haven't solved the problem, you guys. We've left the problem on the table. Thanks a lot. However, I am going to say that everybody that, you know, that the Todd and Barry were really saying, we got problems here with this tomorrow at the meeting, because I am at the meeting tomorrow for two hours. So, um, but anyway, I want to thank you guys for coming. You all, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get myself away from you guys because that's not a good thing. You folks for coming. I um, I hope you enjoy, you got a taste of Todd and then I, I want to get him back here face to face so we can, I can't add phrase, so we can get him and do more um, workshops and you know, and, and you all become advocates for those of us who are fighting this battle in the school districts. Um, so, uh, and if you're interested in, you, you guys should have my, e you, or you folks should have my email. If there's any information from Todd that you want, let me know. I did post in the chat. And the only reason I did it is I'm teaching a, a, liter a, a Holocaust literature class. And I posted this link, which is to the monastery that has the artwork um, from, um, uh, from, I can't pronounce his name, Marion Todd. Colgitz. Cold, yeah. Marion Yeah. 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 So um, and it's an unbelievable site. You can't, it's an entire basement of a monastery. It's a little freaky um, part of it. So I posted that. And if there's any resources that you want, or if you want to know more about the mandate, um, drop me an email. I'm happy to send it. I'm hoping when we're back face to face, um, we'll bring Todd up to, to walk us through some of these, you know, and, um, and I'm hoping that Todd will be bringing a Yahad training up here soon. Um, and because that is just another fascinating, um, another fascinating perspective, which I think is great because it almost turns students into CSI investigators. And for you know younger kids, the idea of doing investigation and, and I think is fascinating. Um, so I'd like to share that with everybody. So otherwise, if we don't have questions, thank you all. Uh, Jerry, Jerry, the 
um, I, I just checked, with, or I don't know if people have been watching the chat, but Janet said that um, and she's from Ames and they're, they're the ones who are enabling us to, to view this. Mm -hmm. She said she checked with her social media expert and the present, this presentation can be viewed on the Ames Facebook page even after it's over. Mm -hmm. That's all. Oh, and wait, there's something here. Oh, oh, and tomorrow is Dr. Booker's presentation at 315, The Sacred Cause, The Nationalist Civil Religion, Mass Slaughter and Genocide in the Third Reich. If you're not depressed enough yet, the rise of the Nazi emperor, <laughs> like this God, right, cannot be understood simply as a reaction yeah. to the sociocultural economic dislocation. It's a messianic civil religious movement. I think this is the kind of things that I think connect with students today. Um, you know, yesterday we were talking about that line from, from the preface to survival in Auschwitz about how you just assume people are bad. It's so relevant to now, which is why I think the mandate, the education is important. So especially on a day like today where we just had, you know, a little bit of a victory um, in terms of a move against systemic racism. So, um, so thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm upset too that it's not being done with the sort of fidelity and, but, but maybe I think Todd is right. I have a feeling that, that once it's out there, you know, the best education, the best learning takes place in the revision process. And so I'm hoping that as we revise eventually, that perhaps we'll, we'll do a better job and, uh, and address these. So thank you so much. I am, um, I always love doing these events. And I love this week and I can't wait. And I, I hate to say this, but I can't wait till next week when we're maybe next next April when we're all face to face. So thank you. Everybody have a wonderful night. And uh, and I'll see you around. Thanks. Jerry, don't go anywhere. Yep, I got I'll something for you, Jerry. Quickly. Yep, no. I'll stay here. Bye, you guys. Bye. Thank you to Todd. That was excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I, I hear it every year, but it's. Um...